Naruto is the reincarnation of both Ashura and Indra Atsutsuki. Having a hard life in the village because of being alone and hated by the village. Naruto finds help from a man long thought dead. Harem Naruto. Victory cannot be achieved without sacrifice Victor Reznov. Minato. Sunlight poured into the hospital. It was a cool fresh light, fitting for beginnings. Inside the hospital room, the light fell across Minato's face and touched an opening there, tugging on his lips, making the smile more radiant. The light flowed across the room, scattered a thousand tiny rainbow beginnings on the shiny medicine bottle. So, Minato, have you decided on a name for the boy yet? Asked a curious Jureya, breaking the comfortable silence. Why yes, indeed we have. I think you like it, Jureya sensei Minato replied. Well then, out with it, brat. What did you decide to name him? Naruto, Minato said simply, allowing his smile to grow wider. It was the name of the protagonist of his teacher's first novel. The Night of the Attack. An involuntary chill ran down Minato's back as he turned around to see who was behind him. No one. His eyes instantly narrowed, all semblance of emotion gone from his face, now displaying a cold ruthlessness the face of a kage. Reveal yourself. Who are you? As soon as the words flew out of his clenched teeth, someone materialized right in front of him he took in the man's appearance. He was wearing a long black coat and a white mask with ripples in the design, and a hole for one eye god, was that a Sharingan? Me? I'm Toby. Nice to meet you, Hokage-san. I know as well as you that the name you just gave me is fake. Who are you really? What do you want? Oh? I thought the Yon Dayame Hokage of Konoha was supposed to be a genius at deduction. Surely you can tell my identity with a look. Do that trick of yours now. Deduce who I am. Toby's voice seemed falsely cheerful. Minato Saidi really didn't have the time for this. At first glance, I'd say that you're an Ichiha. But you're not. If you were, you'd be a missing nin, except for the fact that there has been no Ichiha missing nin in the last seven years, the masked man twitched. Therefore, you're not an Ichiha. And you look young, I'd say you are about 17, 18. That leaves us with only one alternative. Seeing as you have chosen to reveal only one Sharingan eye and the fact that you wear a mask to cover your face, I'd say you found an Achiha in battle, killed him and took his eye for yourself, Toby took a step closer to Minato. The look in the masked man's eye told him he was wrong. Was the man, angry? I see that I was wrong about that. Ah well. But, you seem to know me I can see the recognition in your eyes, the masked man twitched again. And you're angry. I could go on, but I don't really have the time to squabble with a kid right now. I suggest you go back to wherever you came from before you get hurt. The masked man started laughing. It was a burst of maniacal, insane laughter the laugh of someone who has lost everything. Very well done, Hokage-san. You're still the same as ever. I am the tiniest bit disappointed, however. I thought, of all people, you would recognize me. I guess I've changed a lot more than I thought I had, said Toby, sighing. Minato, however, was even faster than Toby. Depending on who you asked, he was the fastest ninja ever to live. The technique Toby was using was definitely a space-time jutsu. He knew it would be hard to fight against this strange jutsu, but he'd observed that Toby needed about two seconds before he performed the technique again. And that opening was all he needed. The two shinobi clashed, and this time Minato managed to use the opening the tri-pronged kunai made its way into his hands as quick as a bolt of lightning as he slashed Toby's arm in the two-second window before he could use the technique again. When they separated, Toby was bleeding. For a moment, the fight stopped as Toby inspected the nick on his arm. It seems that I underestimated you, Hokage-san. You've only grown better with the passing of years. Minato's lips turned upwards as he began running. Again the two clashed, and again, and again. It wasn't until 10 minutes had passed lasting 10 minutes against the fastest ninja in the world was a feat in and of itself that Minato was able to find an opening to use again. He threw the kunai, both of them close, his Rasengan passed through his shoulder. I won. Suddenly Minato disappeared, grabbing the kunai in mid-air before he slammed his Rasengan on his back, causing an enormous crater. Minato looked around to see Toby clenching his right arm before it started falling on the ground, and instead of blood, white goo came out of it. The masked man was about to run away when Minato teleported in front of him and slammed his hand on his chest. Contract seal. Back in the battlefield, Kurama was finishing his tailed beast bomb when the Sharingan in his eyes slowly disappeared. Before the bomb was launched at the village, he raised his head upwards in the last second, throwing the bomb in the air, after a few seconds, the bomb exploded, causing a bright light that illuminated the entire arena around the hidden leaf village and beyond. Suddenly, a massive wind wave came through the village so strong that some small trees were ripped apart. To his surprise, the third Hokage opened his eyes again after the light was gone, but Kyubi wasn't there anymore. The only thing was an enormous crater where Kyubi had stood. Minato. Outside Kanoha. 
The loud cries of a baby could be heard in the darkness of the night, has blonde hair, blue eyes, and three whisker marks on each cheek. Naruto, a boy suddenly said, looking down at his son, how it had gone so wrong, he didn't know. The masked man had attacked them out of nowhere. He wore a mask and had short dark hair and Sharingan. The man looking down at the baby had long blonde hair that reached his shoulders, his wife, Kishina Uzumaki, was close to him. I'm sorry, Kishina, but I couldn't control anything the voice of the giant fox behind them was heard. Kishina turned her head to look at him, she smiled sadly and shook her head. It wasn't his fault. The mask had taken over Kyubi and then summoned him in the middle of the village. He had started killing and destroying everything on his way until Minato cancelled his seal contract, but the damage was already done. Minato then takes Kishina, Naruto, and Kurama away from the village to seal him inside Naruto. Kishina didn't have that long because Kyubi was extracted from her, despite being an Uzumaki, she knew her time was coming, her legs were feeling weaker. Mina-kun, you sure about this? W dot dot we both know how Jinchurikas are treated, Kishina asked, afraid that Naruto wouldn't have a happy childhood. He would already have a hard life because he wouldn't have his parents to raise him, advise him, and see him have his first steps, his first word, and tell tales when he's scared. But worst of all, the grief for their lost ones would probably blind them and be harsher to their baby boy. Naruto was only a few minutes old, and he might be treated harshly because of grief. Minato looked at her with sadness, he was thinking the same thing, but he had no choice. I can't tell someone else to sacrifice their children, and who better than the Hokage of the village to seal Kurama. He glanced down at Naruto, who looked to be sleeping. I trust Hiruzen, he will take care of him, and the same for Jureya-sensei, he answered to convince her that everything would be alright, but at this point, he wasn't sure who he was convincing. After that, he turned to Kurama whose gaze was at Naruto, and his eyes showed shock. The fourth Hokage didn't know why the big fox looked at Naruto with a shocked face, but didn't have time to ask. Minato took a deep breath, take care of Naruto, Kurama. I believe in you, Minato stated, the giant fox turned to him and nodded his head and then turned to Kushi, who kneeled close to Naruto and touched his whiskers. Even if no one cares for him, I will always be there for him, Kurama promised. That brought a big smile to Kishina's face, who shed tears and turned to Kurama. Thank you for being my friend Kura, she said smiling, and the big fox smiled back. Minato then did a few hand signs to bring Shinigami. What do you want, mortal? The reaper asked, his tongue licking his big knife. Minato was panting and turned to look at him with no fear in his eyes. I want you to seal Kyubi inside Naruto, Minato demanded, showing no fear to the Shinigami. The Shinigami narrowed his eyes before nodding. Slowly Kurama shrank inside Naruto, who was still quietly sleeping. In his stomach formed a seal that looked like the Uzumaki symbol, a spiral. You have a few minutes, Shinigami stated. Minato managed to smile slightly before slowly walking up to Naruto, who was in Kushi's arms, she was rocking him in his arms. Tears rolled down her cheek. His eyes turned to look at Naruto's palms and noticed a sun in his right palm, and he turned his eyes to his left palm to see a moon. Minato wondered what that symbol was, but he didn't have time for that now, not anymore. Lying close to his wife, he looked at what their love had brought to this world. A beautiful boy, he is perfect in every way possible. His hand slowly reached Kushi's red hair, his thumb touching her soft and beautiful red hair. Kishina kept looking at Naruto, she didn't want to believe that their time was limited, how much she wished that she and Mina-kun could stay like this forever. Kushi-kun, we need to say our goodbye, she suddenly heard Minato's voice. She slowly nodded her head, she looked down at Naruto again, his eyes slowly opened to reveal ocean blue eyes like Minato, she smiled at her treasure, and Naruto smiled a little. He recognizes us, Kishina thought. Naruto, my baby boy, I know you will have a hard time without us, but you should know me Nakun, and I love you more than life itself. You will eventually grow up and with the time will come naturally to like girls, choose a girl who loves you, who's always there for your happiest times and your lowest points. And you will soon meet Jiraiya, don't become like him, but he's still a good man who will take care of you. I love you. My Sachi, Kishina said, tears streaming down her cheek. Minato smiled at Naruto, and his son smiled back. Naruto, I want you to become what you want, do something that brings you happiness, Kakashi will be there for you as well, I know it. Please, if you become a shinobi, be strong and take care of your loved ones, and as your mother told you, chose a girl that loves you and is a bit hothead. Dot dot. Minato felt everything slowly darkening, the last thing he saw was his son crying in Kushi's arms before everything went dark, and his head fell in the cold ground. Kishina's chest was barely rising, she could hear Naru crying in her arms, but her whole body started feeling numb, her legs first, and now her arms didn't feel anything anymore. Her eyes still at her treasure with her last strength, she smiled at him, and her chest stopped raising. Naruto started crying even more and not stopping. 
His blue eyes slowly changed, his pupil shrank, and his eyes began to change color from blue to metallic purple. The white area of his eyes completely disappeared and left the eyes completely purple. Three rings appeared in a rippling pattern out from the center. His eyes stayed like that for a few moments before turning back to normal blue eyes. Okage office. Tsuritobi stood alone in his office, deep in thought, the only sound heard in the office was the sound of Naruto crying his heart out. He had been crying since the old Hokage found him, despite him trying to cheer him up somehow, he didn't stop. He kept on crying and didn't stop. Because of the sudden attack from Kyubi, the hospital of Konoha was full of injured people, the nurses and doctors left were doing everything they could to save people. To the old Hokage's surprise, a medical ninja checked on Naruto to see if he needed anything. Naruto was perfectly healthy and just needed milk. The nurse feeds Naruto, but the newborn starts crying again after that. Okage didn't understand how things could have gone south so quickly, and the place was secured, so why did this happen? Minato was there to make sure Kyubi would not escape, but it seems that wasn't enough. Earning a headache, he massaged his temples, how Kyubi escaped and ended up attacking the village was a mystery, but the old Hokage had another question on his mind. The strange symbols in Naruto's palms, a sun, and a moon. After he had put Naruto in the crib, the old Hokage had started searching through books to find anything that might help his situation, but it seemed there was nothing there. Suddenly the door opened, inside came walking a pale-looking Jiraiya, his usual happy face was gone. Instead, a frown had conjured his face. The last time the old Hokage remembered his student to look like that was when the Waki and Dan had died on the battlefield. Tsunade still hasn't been able to move on since Dan died. Jiraiya, I'm, what happened? Jiraiya interjected him. The old Sanin had been outside the village to do his spying duty when he received a toad informing him of the tragedy in Konoha. Originally he had wanted to wait until Naruto reached one month old to see him, but instead, he got information that his prized student wasn't anymore, his son in all but name. I don't know how it happened, Kyubi showed in the middle of the village out of nowhere, Minato took him a few miles outside Konoha to seal him inside Naruto. Kishina had not been able to survive the extraction, and Minato sealed Kyubi using Reaper Death Seal, the third Hokage said with a grave tone, barely a whisper. Gureya closed his eyes and took it all in, his student was gone, how it could have gone so wrong. He felt tears in his eyes, but he didn't want to cry now, he shouldn't. He opened his eyes again, took a deep breath, and looked at the blonde bundle that had fallen silent in the room, it seemed to be tired of crying and had fallen asleep. Walking over to him, he noticed his sunny hair like Minato, whiskers in each side of his cheek. His cheeks were red and puffy and the same for his eyes. Looking at him now, Jiraiya could see the similarities, looking closely at his face, for a moment, he felt like it was Minato. Moving his head away in fear and sadness, he couldn't look at him right now, and it reminded him so much of Minato. He felt his sadness rising all over again, like a violent river taking over all his body to the darkness of abysses. Jiraiya his thoughts were broken when he heard the voice of his sensei in his ears. Pinching the bridge of his nose and wiping away unshed tears, he turned his head around, almost feeling heavier. Jiraiya. I know how you feel the son in wanted to say that he didn't, but remembered that his wife had been killed in the attack and kept his mouth shut. But Minato chose you as the godfather of Naruto. You're his guardian, and I want to know what will you do. The third asked quietly, hoping he wasn't rushing, and Jiraiya wasn't felt pressured to make a decision so soon. I, he paused and turned around, not daring to look at his sensei right now. I need to make sure that the other villages don't try to attack us. Kumo and I will think of this as an open invitation to war, and my job is to protect him, he stated, pointing at the newborn. And I will. From outside. To make sure no enemy village will attack Konoha, Jiraiya finished as if trying to convince himself more than the Hokage. Sighing, he knew they needed what Jiraiya was implying. Very well, but I hope you return soon, Hokage said, and Jiraiya nodded his head after a moment of hesitation. Leaving the office almost in a hurry, the old Hokage heard Naruto start crying again. Council room. The same night, Naruto was fed by the nurse again, checked again to make sure he was healthy after a lengthy check. The nurse said that the baby was as healthy as a baby can be, much to Saratobi's surprise, she said she had never seen a baby more healthy than Naruto. A meeting was called to discuss what they had lost, the cost to rebuild the village, and the empty place left of the Hokage. The fox was gone, non-existent like it had never been there. The Yondaime was gone as well, and his spirit departed for the belly of the Shinigami. He left behind a wife who followed him into the abyss and a son only a few hours old that he had entrusted to jail the most fearsome of beasts. Truly, it was a sad day in Kinohagakure. Old Suratobi, the Sondaime Hokage, stood with a tiny blonde baby in his arms. The babe slept soundly, unmindful of the gathering of elders that were assembled to decide his fate. Saratobi did not know why the fools had even gathered. 
the boy's fate was already decided. And Saratobi meant to keep his destiny unaltered. He listened as the council bickered back and forth, some for killing the baby, some for saving it, honoring the wishes of their dead Hokage. This was a trying time for the village, and patience ran thin. Even for one of infinite patience like Saratobi. He'd never had to raise his voice before to get the point across. One does not attain the title god of shinobi by being loud and spontaneous. Ninja is calm, collected, silent, and deadly. All these things encompassed what Saratobi stood for. What set him apart from the pack was his high level of intelligence. And that intelligence would grant him a successor and save the village in this time and in future times. No one noticed as he rose from his seat, the babe still sleeping peacefully in his arms. Enough. Be silent. The room quieted immediately, and even the tiny bundle in his arms woke and stared at him reverently. But no sound did it make. He smiled down at the blonde wonder, and then turned his gaze back to the council. I have sat and listened to your nonsense long enough. This child will not be slain. He will not be made into a mindless weapon. He will not be used. He is a child of Konoha, and he holds within him the most powerful of beasts. He deserves our respect above all. The nameless council member, one of the civilians, rose. But Lord Hokage, the Kyubi could break free at any moment. Knowledge of the seal says that its soul is bound to the boys, and that upon the boy's death, it will die with him. Would it not be best to kill him now and avoid any future issues? Tsuritobi narrowed his eyes at the civilian and spoke in a level voice. This child shall not be killed. His own life is a sacrifice. Even if the Kyubi dies, he will be reborn again after nine years in the same place he died. The Yondaime chose him to hold the Kyubi, and he believed that his people would see this boy for what he is. That said, many of the civil council pale at the thought that Kyubi would return. And what is he? Someone asked. A hero. A Jinchuriki. He is a living sacrifice and a living testament to a human's tenacious hold on life. I will ensure that this boy serves Konoha. I might love the people of this village, but if the leaders themselves can't tell the difference between a harmless child and the most murderous of all demons, then how can I trust the villagers to let him live a peaceful life? He lifted the child and held it out for all to see. The blonde babe giggled and flapped its arms merrily. Saratobi allowed a small smile to cross his face. Now then. Look upon this child and tell me where the malice is. Where is the unbridled hatred and rage that the Kyubi exuded? Where is the fear that should be present in all of you if he were the Kyubi? But it could be a trick of the Kyubi to lure us into false hope. It could be pretending to be harmless. Saratobi frowned and wrapped the baby back up in its swaddling clothes. And how exactly is that child different from any other newborn? What newborn doesn't look upon the world with wondering eyes? This baby has been born into a cold, harsh world on the worst night of our village's history. He will be ostracized and hated if he mingles amongst the villagers, and I will not have that. I will ensure the boy grows to be a ninja of exceptional quality. I will ensure that he is pure of heart and loyal to the village. And how do you mean to ensure all that? I will be busy in my job as the Hokage, but I will visit him every now and then, making sure he's happy," Hokage responded to Donzo, who glared at both the old Hokage and the newborn weapon. Hiruzen had decided to keep a secret about the weird symbol in Naruto's palms, and he didn't need more attention than he already had. The man from the clan head stood up, the man was known as Hugaku Uchiha. Lord Hokage, let me raise Naruto. The Achiha clan would welcome him with open arms, Fugaku spoke with a neutral tone, at first, he wanted to mention that Kishina was a good friend of his wife, therefore, she would be more than happy to raise Naruto, but he wasn't sure yet if the old Hokage would reveal to everyone who's Naruto's parent were. Anzo narrowed his eyes while Hiruzen's facial expression didn't change from the outside. No. If I were to give Naruto to any clan, their power and influence would increase, therefore breaking the balance in the village. Naruto will be raised in an orphanage, Hiruzen stated, ignoring the glare of Donzo. Fugaku sighed, disappointed since he could be a good friend with Sasuke, but decided to keep his mouth shut. Sitting back in the chair, Saratobi decided to end the meeting. This meeting is over, Saratobi spoke and left the room with Naruto, who was sleeping. Walking outside, Shukaku Nara shook his head in disappointment, he turned to his friends and gestured for them to follow him out. Everyone left, and Donzo quickly reached his office, closing the door, he snapped his fingers, and two weapons kneeled in front of him. I want you to spy on Naruto Uzumaki, blonde hair, three whiskers in each cheek, newborn, the Jinchuriki of Kyubi. I want any valuable information, Donzo stated, and they both left as if they were never there, to begin with. Soon he will be mine. Any man who says I am the king is not true king to in Lannister. The sun blazed bright gold through the open windows of the Hokage's office. Summer warmth threaded its way even into the deep ravines of Saratobi's wrinkled hands, easing the aches of worn joints and the onset of arthritis. 
Though he was faced with a mountain of paperwork three hours high, the San Daime Hokage of Kanohagakure spared a moment for the joy of the summer afternoon. He breathed in the scent of heated earth and leaves, a faint tinge of wood smoke, a whiff of compost. Even the sounds of his village floated upon the gentle breeze. A laugh here, the clatter of a cart there. A light rap on his office door. Come in, he called out, straightening the official hat where it lay, abandoned, on his desk. The tall man slid into the room, moving as if neither gravity's decree nor the limitations of joints and bones applied to him. The handle of a sword protruded from behind one shoulder. Okage-sama is Naruto, the Anbu spoke, and the third flinched before immediately leaving through the window. Earlier. The streets of Kanoha were crowded this morning as people returned from work and families went out for dinner. The murmurings of the crowd and its footfalls were loud as they were carried over the rooftops. In a small ally, a little nook of isolation, sat a young boy of five or six staring out at the crowd with a pair of sad-looking blue eyes. He had a home of sorts. A small apartment where he lived alone. But he didn't like it much there. Sitting on his bed alone and in silence was unbearable for him. For some reason, he preferred to sit as he was now. He was watching and listening to the crowd of people from a distance. Sometimes he would walk in the crowd pretending he was one of them. He would have switched places with any of them if he could. If he walked next to someone for a bit, he could almost imagine he wasn't alone. But the look in the eyes of the crowd when he was out in the open was just as bad as being alone in its own way. Those eyes made him feel cold and the warmed people had just shown on their faces drained away when they noticed his presence. It felt as though he had done something wrong, but he could never guess as to what it was. Even now, as he sat watching, a few people passing by would notice him and he could instantly feel the chilling effect of their impersonal eyes. He ducked his head into his arms to avoid them. It was his only defense. What are you doing in there all by yourself? The boy looked up quickly, surprised by the kindness in the man's voice. It was an older man with graying hair at the temples who had spoken. His face held a pleasant smile. The kind of which the boy had often seen but never actually received. Words escaped the blonde child in this unfamiliar situation. He merely just looked on as the man took a few steps into the ally so he could get a better look at the child in the dim light. Are you alone? What's your, the man stopped in mid-step, recognizing the boy. The smile vanished from his face and his jaw took a hard line as he struggled internally. The boy felt the chill crawl into his heart as he saw the kindness and warmth dissipate before him. Again he wondered why. The man took a step back, his eyes clouding, it's you, I hope you feel every pain you brought to this village. He could only blink and watch as the scenario repeated itself. It was not completely uncommon for people to act like this towards him. The man was back at the ally entrance now, my daughter, the man shook his head at the floor, if only you had never come, she would still be. He was unable to finish the sentence as he covered his mouth and left. A few in the passing crowd noticed and watched the boy for a time before they continued to wherever they were going. The small blonde boy just sat there unmoving even after the man had left. His body and mind were felt numb from the cold he felt in his heart. He would cry, but he couldn't. Something in the way people treated him made him feel as if it were his fault. That they should be the ones crying while he had no right. People ignored him, everyone ignored him, they didn't harm him physically, but they always gave him hateful looks, Naruto heard the whispers around him, calling him a monster, some called him demon, but the little blonde never understood why. Despite no physical harm, the glares and the words and the loneliness he felt every day was worse than any harm he could receive. He was kicked from the orphanage when he reached four years old and forced to live in the streets until an Anbu with a dog mask found him. The following day, the Hokage gave him a place to live, a roof above his head to live, alone. The Hokage was kind, but whenever he asked him. Who were my parents? He would answer him that they gave their lives for the village, but nothing else, just a vague answer with no real meaning behind it. Other times he would try to change the subject, but Naruto noticed all that. He could feel that the Hokage lied to him, but he was the Hokage and not him after all. Compared to him, he was just a child with no people to look after him, with no power to protect himself. Naruto was only a little kid with no one around, no one to call Tuchan, no one to call Kachan, no one to call family. No one to love him. The word itself felt strange to Naruto, he knew what it meant, but at the same time, he didn't, he had tried a few times to talk to children of his age, but their parents would always pull them away, telling them that Naruto was nothing but trouble. Naruto had wanted to read books to pass the time, but the orphanage made sure to never allow his books until three months ago. Naruto didn't even know how to read or write, learning how to read and write felt like the best day for Naruto. Hours passed and he continued to sit there waiting for the sadness to go away so he could return to his empty home. The streets were empty at this late hour and the city had quieted. It was in this deep silence that he thought he heard something. It was a faint sound. But it seemed to grow louder in his ears as he focused on it. It was rhythmic. 
Drip drip drip. He closed his eyes to focus harder, the sound grew louder still. It started to sound like it was right next to him when he opened his eyes and found himself somewhere unfamiliar. It was an enormous and very dark hall. The floor was only slightly flooded, but the water came up above his knees since he was so small. He pressed his lips together, feeling afraid. Only slightly, though. He began to walk, his curiosity growing as he did so. In truth, he did not want to leave this place. He did not want to go back to the ally or back home. While he was afraid, he also had an odd feeling about this place. Or maybe it was the lack of emotion. In any case, he recognized that he was not alone here. He walked till he came to an enormous gate that was locked tight. The type of which he thought was supposed to keep him out. Until he heard a raspy breathe from within the darkness. Then it seemed more likely it was to keep something from getting out. The blonde peered into the darkness behind bars looking for the source of the breathing. Before Naruto could get closer to see who or what was behind the gate, he suddenly felt a gaze behind him. But he didn't feel a malice coming from this one, no this one felt calm, even calmer than the gaze of the Hokage. Felt like the feeling he got around in nature, a sense of peace and belonging. Slowly turning around, almost afraid that whoever looked at him with kindness would disappear, and Naruto would understand that it was just his imagination. Fully turned, he saw strange purple eyes looking at him directly in the eyes, Naruto didn't know why. But he felt he had seen the older man before. The man looked old, but the most surprising thing, he was floating above the floor, his legs in a cross position, and below him were six strange dark balls. From the naked eye, the balls looked usual, just dark color, but Naruto could feel something strange, a feeling. Naruto's focus turned to the older man again, and he had a long pointy beard and two fangs on his forehead. Slightly pale skin, his hair spiky and brown, and a strange small red circle on his forehead, had smaller dark circles. Wearing a long white kimono that covered his entire body, across his chest were six painted tomo. Despite being old, Naruto could feel the insane strength in him. His chakra was enormous, compared to Hokage, he felt like a dragon compared to an ant. Naruto stayed silent, not knowing what to say, he still wasn't sure where he was. It's good to see you, Ashura and Indra, the man called Naruto with melancholy on his tone, taking Naruto by surprise. Talking to him as if he knew him, but Naruto was sure that he had never seen the man before. Indra? Ashura who are they? And why is he calling me like that? Naruto asked himself, and for a moment, he thought the older man was mistaken, but the strange cold feeling he usually got when someone lied to him wasn't there this time. Naruto opened his mouth to respond, but found no words leaving his mouth, closing it. He took the courage needed and asked. Boo, who are you? And why are you calling me Indra and Ashura? Naruto asked respectfully and not meeting the eyes of the older man. Despite feeling calm and his gaze was kind towards him, Naruto had understood the hard way not to look people you don't know in the eye, some people in shops had started throwing things at him this one time, another time, he had wanted to look at a mask, but the shopper had pushed him roughly to the ground, his back had ached the whole day, but the worst part. The shopper had thrown the mask to his head with enough force that his forehead had started bleeding. Naruto had looked around the crowd of people that had gathered to see if anyone wanted to help him, or maybe looking at the shopper with disapproval and anger. But instead, the crowd had looked at Naruto with anger, earning approval looks from them, a crowd had gathered around him, and for a moment, Naruto was afraid they would start beating him, but instead after a minute, the crowd had split up, some glaring daggers at him, piercing his little heart like knives. Naruto had cried himself to sleep that night, talking to himself, asking himself why no one was with him. Escaping his thoughts, the older man chuckled and smiled at Naruto that the blonde gladly returned. He smiled and spoke with a tone almost like an old friend. My name is Hagoromo Atsutsuki. I'm what people know as the Sage of the Six Paths, he introduced himself, still smiling warmly at the little kid in front of him. Hagoromo glanced at the moon and sun symbol on his palms. He had no doubts who the kid was, and he could swear he saw his son standing behind Naruto, like guards. Ashura with his usual happy face but almost looking wary. While Lindra had a cold hard look on his eyes, his Mingekyo Sharingan shining like a dark and red star, his Mingekyo looking like the symbol of Uzumaki clan, behind his back, was tied the war fan, Gunbai. His face was as emotionless as the day he fraught against Ashura. Naruto realized where the older man was looking, moving his palms behind his back, almost afraid. He knew about the strange symbols on his palms, even asked the Hokage what they meant, and to Naruto's surprise. The Hokage actually didn't know the answer. Naruto, of course, had tried to wash it away, he remembered one time, he wanted to wash it away for almost an hour straight without stopping, thinking they were the reason that people hated him after this one woman had called him a freak, and that the symbol was there to show it, everyone, that he's a monster in human form. Hiding his hands away, he turned to look at the older man again with a confused look. Sage of Six Paths. 
Naruto asked with a tiny voice, almost afraid to ask, his eyes still focusing on the floor. Agaromo frowned, his displeasure visible, he didn't really understand why the Kage would let the village treat Naruto like this, it is almost like he wants Naruto to betray the village. The Jinchuriki is supposed to be the most secret weapon of the village. Literally, everyone in the village knows his identity when it is supposed to be top secret so that the information wouldn't come out and no enemy shinobi would try to assassinate him and therefore getting rid of the most powerful asset of the village. Not only that, but the Bijuu would be revived in the place he died, and without the fourth Hokage this time, and without an Uzumaki to hold the insane strength of Kurama, the village would be destroyed. Knowing the kid didn't know who he was, Hagoromo smiled again, trying to ease the tension the kid was feeling. You don't have to be afraid of me, Naruto, as for who I am. People around the world know me as the father of all shinobi. I walked this land almost two millennia ago. Naruto gasped at the information and immediately bowed his head respectfully but decided to say nothing since he didn't know it would be appropriate to talk without being asked. As I said, you don't need to be afraid. And we don't do that here. I'm sure you have questions, so feel free to ask away, Hagoromo spoke with a kind tone. Naruto said nothing but could feel that the old man truly meant it, so he took a step forward, his hand slowly moving in front and not hiding behind his back anymore. Slightly relaxing, he decided to ask a question. Why are you here? And how are you, alive? Naruto asked but almost sure that the man in front of him couldn't be alive, at least not in the way humans are usually alive. Hagoromo chuckled at him. I'm not really alive, and I won't be here for long. I'm here because of you, Hagoromo spoke and pointed towards his palms. Naruto, understanding, looked downwards at his palms almost in hesitation. You know why I have the weird symbols? Naruto asked, looking back at the older man again. The moon and the sun shows that you're the reincarnation of my sons. Ashura Atsutsuki and Indra Atsutsuki Hagoromo answered and saw the gears working on Naruto's head. After a second, Naruto raised his eyebrows. Reincarnated why? Naruto asked, but at the same time, he couldn't really believe it, he knew a shinobi could do many things, but reincarnation is something he had never heard of, again, he didn't know that much, since his sources of books and materials to read and earn knowledge were very limited. The old Hokage gave him enough to eat and drink and buy a few things, but sadly every store sold him at three times the price. Therefore leaves him almost no money to spend on books, much to his annoyance. Naruto had wanted for some time to ask the older man to give him more money probably, but figured he didn't have more, but at the same time, Naruto wondered if his parents had left him anything. If they were shinobi, just as Hokage stated, then the chances that they must have left something to him were high. My son Ashura and Indra were brothers but at the same time, enemies. My son Ashura believed that people working together is where the true strength comes from, while well, Indra believed that only your own strength mattered. After I announced that Ashura would be my heir, my other son Indra betrayed us and started a war that never ended, my son Indra was reincarnated again in Madara Chiha, and my son Ashura was reincarnated in Hashirama Senju, they fought each other, continuing the war, he stopped with pain in his eyes and looked directly at Naruto's eyes. Until you were born, he finished with a hint of relief and pride in his tone. Naruto understood what he meant, but at the same time wondered why would that happen, he knew who Senju Hashirama was, the first Hokage was still known as the god of shinobi. He had never heard of Ichiha Madara, but he must have been strong from what Hagoromo told him. But this confused Naruto, he wasn't of the Ichiha clan, hell Naruto was sure that he didn't belong to any clan as far as he knew. He had the name Uzumaki, but no clan in Konoha had that name, and no one said anything about an actual Uzumaki clan. And he was dead sure that he didn't belong to Senju clan, so why would they be reincarnated in him? As if he could read his mind, Hagoromo raised his hand and spoke. The reason why is because you are a child of Uzumaki, Senju and Ichiha clan. Just like me, Hagoromo stated with a smile. Naruto was shocked, and his eyes widened, he instinctively took a half step back from Hagoromo. What, what, that's impossible. If that's true, why hasn't the Ichiha clan raised me, and I have never heard of Uzumaki clan, Naruto stated with both happiness and anger in his tone. His teeth clenched, his eyes narrowed, and his knuckles turned white as milk. If what the older man said was true, then why didn't he have a family? His parents might be dead, but what about the others, did the others of his clan not care for him to raise him, or did they see me as a monster? Naruto asked himself in the end, with a tear developing on his right eye, did they abandon him? Did no one really love him? Did they call him demon behind his back like all the others? I don't know why Naruto, he was interrupted by a third voice in the big dark hall. Perhaps I might answer that. Naruto looked around to see who talked when he saw a pair of giant red eyes looking at them from behind bars. The blonde didn't know why, but he didn't feel scared or threatened by the creature behind bars. He felt relaxed and a feeling he usually got whenever he ate ramen to Ichiraku. 
Agaromo chuckled and turned to look at Karama with kindness. It's been a long time, Karama. Vengeance is an idiot's game Arthur Morgan. Atsutsuki Ashura was chosen as the successor of Ninshu because of his ideals of peace, however, this didn't agree with his elder brother, Atsutsuki Indra. Indra thought that since he was the eldest, he should lead the world in his father's place. Angered at his younger brother and father, he tried to fight his brother for the position. After the battle between them, Indra, feeling humiliated from the defeat by his brother, left promising to destroy Ashura and his brethren. Ashura took his role as successor to Ninshu very seriously, going so far as to travel the four corners of the world just like his father, in hopes of teaching people about the special property that allowed one to be one with it, not just nature, and be one with everyone as well. He even gained some followers during his travel. Just like his father, he too shared his chakra with his followers. His children started calling themselves Senju and Uzumaki. He had two sons and a daughter. On the other hand, when Indra heard the exploits of his younger brother, he too gained some followers who were against the ideals of peace through love and wanted to bring peace in the world through power alone. His children gained the power of the Sharingan. He had four sons and two daughters. His descendants started calling themselves Achiha, ironically, who too held hate for Ashura's descendant. Time caught up to him, just as it did for every living thing, and it took his life away. Indra, who was a genius, also had a similar fate. Despite all of his natural genius, he was also someone that time removed. Everyone had to die at some stage. Their descendants fell very short of their ancestors' wishes. They forgot their burden and tasks they should have carried on through their blood. Naruto looked at the giant fox behind bars. The Kyubi had orange silky looking fur, with black markings around his eyes connected to his, funnily enough, rabbit-like ears. The upper body was humanoid, including the hands. The lower body was just like a fox, barring the nine long swaying tails in the back. The fire was the closest thing they looked like. The red, slitted eyes looked him closely with a hint of malice. Naruto spoke first. You're the Kyubi. Naruto half shouted, and suddenly everything made sense to him, it clicked in his head as he had just found the last missing piece of the puzzle. The glares, the words, the hatred behind the eyes of everyone, suddenly made sense. Kyubi was sealed inside him. Naruto's face pales, and he finds himself looking downwards, he had many questions in his head, but many of them, why me? Why did the fourth sealed Kyubi inside me? Why do people hate me then? I'm the reason Kyubi is not out there killing people. Do they not understand how seals work? Naruto asked himself in confusion. Naruto stood silent and just kept his gaze at the floor, and he didn't understand it, why did the fourth Hokage choose him? Did he choose him because he had no parents and therefore much more accessible to burden him, rather than someone with parents? Hirama looked at him with concern written all over his face, well true, the citizens didn't try to harm him, except three times. However, still, he knew Naruto suffered from the number of insults, glares thrown at him every day, but most importantly, he longed for love, for someone to call a friend, for someone to call family. While Naruto wondered why Kyubi had attacked his village, sure everyone around him said that Kyubi was a demon, but was it just that? Did he attack the village for no reason other than just being a demon? Go ahead and ask your questions. The Kyubi snickered at seeing the boy face fault at having his mind read. I only have one question. Why did you attack Kanoha? He asked firmly before gulping a little as he saw the giant fox narrow its eyes angrily. Its tail shifted some as it took a deep and calming breath. Apparently, it was a sore subject. The masked man with the Sharingan ripped me out of my previous container and put me under his control with that accursed Keke Genkai. I was then taken to your village and forced to rampage through it until your fourth Hokage came and sealed me into you, and that's how we got here. I should warn you that man apparently needed my power for something far beyond simply rampaging through some human village, at least before he was stopped and released his control over me just before I was resealed. He would likely return in the future to try and rip me out of you, and I don't need to tell you that, with this seal, would result in certain death for us, boy. The Kyubi spoke with an angry undertone. Naruto narrowed his eyes at the prospect of being hunted in the future for what he contained. He decided to move on and worry about that later. While Hagoroma wanted to talk with Naruto, his time was running out and he needed to explain everything before he left. Coughing and earning the attention of both Kurama and Naruto, they turned their heads to him. Kurama, you said you knew why the Achiha clan didn't take care of Naruto, so can you shed some light in this manner, Hagoromo asked calmly. Hirama glanced at Naruto for a second, and he wasn't sure how the little blonde would react, knowing that the whole reason why he was alone was that Hokage had refused for anyone to adopt him. The ponytail guy, like a cactus, had requested to raise Naruto. Still, the Hokage had refused, saying that Naruto would strengthen the influence of the said clan and bring unbalance, Kurama didn't fully remember, but Naruto had been in the same room when that happened. 
Kurama had listened to the conversation since Minato and Kashina had made sure that Kurama could help Naruto from the very beginning for anything and even talk to him even without Naruto being in his mindscape. Kurama, of course, understood why the Achiha's clan request to raise Naruto was declined. They had suspicions about why Kyubi had suddenly stopped and not thrown the Bijuu bomb in the middle of the village right before being teleported away by Minato. The Hokage declined any request of any clan to raise Naruto, since it would bring unbalance amongst the village, and you can guess why families with no shinobi background didn't try to adopt Naruto Kurama spoke with a hint of anger, but sadness as well. Naruto's eyes almost fell from his eye sockets, why? Why did you do this? Does he not know that everyone else hates me? Does he not care about me? Naruto asked himself and feeling his chest hurting like never before, tears rolling down his cheek, it wasn't enough that he lied to him about his parents, but denied him the right to be raised by a family that could have loved him, his chakra started rising, and a loud cry escaped his mouth. Ayaya hi aya. Naruto started slamming his fists on the floor, the floor cracked like glass, crying and sobbing, his eyes hurting as someone had just burned his eyes, his chest feeling like he wasn't breathing, and pain spreading around his body like a sickness. Hirama and Hagoroma were about to confront him when trees suddenly grew around Naruto, each with a pointy end and growing around without an actual course, trees and branches started even growing around the walls and the roof. Naruto, calm down. You're not alone, you might feel alone, but I'm your friend, Kurama said with a kind tone. That surprised even Hagoromo. The trees stopped growing, and slowly the trees that had grown around Naruto moved away showing Naruto on his knees crying his eyes out. Slowly raising his head, both Hagoromo and Kurama gasped at the Rinnegan in both of his eyes. Rinnegan Hagoromo thought confused, he knew Naruto would eventually possess the Rinnegan because of Senju and Ichiha blood, but this was way sooner. Before he could actually say anything, the Rinnegan slowly disappeared, and his eyes turned blue again. The moment his eyes turned blue, Naruto felt dizzy, and everything started blacking out. Slowly his body fell in the water. Naruto gasped and opened his eyes to see that he was still in the corner where he was hiding, but he saw several trees had grown all around him. He saw that no one was walking around the street, the streets were empty, and the only thing he could see was the darkness surrounding the streets, the wind blowing around and hitting his face, his sun-kissed hair dancing with the wind, Naruto could hear the tiny sound of a cricket near him. Slowly getting up, he started walking and came out from the corner he was hiding, only to feel several Anbu coming his way. He turned around in time to see the old Hokage show up in front of him and hug him. Naruto was taken back, he thought to return the hug for a moment, but he didn't know what to feel, he felt his anger rising like an angry river. He didn't return the hug, instead, he just had a blank look on his face and stared at one Anbu looking at them. The Anbu had a crow mask and a sword tightened behind his back, dark hair and dark eyes, but what caught Naruto's attention was his chakra. He could feel that his chakra was slightly similar to his. Irizen Saratobi received information that Naruto's wasn't in his apartment and Anbu couldn't find him, after searching around the village, they all had felt the sudden surge of power, arriving there, he was both relieved and worried about seeing Naruto all alone in the street. The old Hokage noticed the trees that had grown and wondered, why? But one thing that bothered him the most was that Naruto didn't return the hug and didn't feel relaxed in his presence like he usually did, like every other time. This time, Saratobi almost felt like Naruto wanted to pull away from him as fast as possible. Pulling away, he saw little Naruto trying to avoid his eyes. Instead, he looked downwards and had a blank look on his face, Saratobi noticed Kakashi looked worried by it. He kneeled at his level and decided to talk to him in his apartment. Naruto didn't say anything and was silent throughout the whole road to his apartment. Usually, he would get excited whenever he spent time with him, but this time he looked like he wanted to do anything but that. Arriving in the apartment, Saratobi first walked inside, followed by Naruto, who was still silent and refusing to say anything. He walked up to his couch and sat on it and still not looking at the Hokage. Deciding to break the growing silence between them, the old Hokage coughed and walked close to Naruto. Naruto, what happened? Where were you? Did someone hurt you? Hiruzen asked kindly, softly grabbing his hands resting on his lap, Naruto flinched slightly from his contact, which Hiruzen noticed. Then, nothing happened. I just fell asleep, and when I woke up, I saw the trees, Naruto answered, not looking at the Hokage, still keeping his head down. Saratobi sighed, knowing he wasn't telling the whole truth, but decided not to pressure Naruto. Moving his hands away, he stood up. Do you need anything, Naruto? The old Hokage asked, wanting to know if the blonde needed anything. Naruto wanted to scream, I need a family, but kept that on his chest like a burden, and instead, he looked up at the old man. I need books to read, the library doesn't really like the demon spoiling their books, Naruto spoke with venom and spat when he said demon. 
Okage's eyes widened, not knowing that information, he hadn't thought that people might refuse to sell Naruto various essential things. Nodding his head. Anything else? Saratobi asked, but Naruto just shook his head, and Saratobi left the room. Naruto clenched his fists tightly in his lap, his pants almost being torn from the strength of his fingers, his teeth clenched, and anger rising inside him again. Naruto, don't worry. If you need to talk to someone, talk with me, Kurama suddenly spoke inside his head. Naruto was surprised to hear Kurama's voice, and a small smile formed on his face, he closed his eyes. Thank you, but I still didn't get your name, Naruto said gratefully. My name is, Kurama, brat, Kurama replied with a slight smile on his face. Naruto nodded his head in understanding and wondered why Kurama was kind to him, at the same time, he asked if he would ever meet Hagoromo again, he still had questions. From what he understood, Indra sought a single individual strength, while Ashura thought that true power came from people working together. Naruto thought that both had a right and that the leader needs to be stronger than the others to protect them, while accepting the help of others and not relying only on his own strength. Sleep Naruto, tomorrow we will start training, Kurama said, and Naruto listened to him. Naruto soon reached an excellent training field with Kurama's help, and the Hokage had given him many books to study and even ninja weapons and tools to train. Naruto had woken up at 6 a.m., ate breakfast and left the apartment. Soon he reached the training field, and Kurama suggested to start by unlocking his chakra. But now to unlock your chakra, and you need to meditate, he said, and saw Naruto raise an eyebrow wanting him to elaborate. What then? He asked, putting his hands behind his head. Well, when you meditate, you will feel this feeling, and you need to pull it towards you, Kurama added, remembering what Kishina had gone through. Naruto nodded his head fast and quickly sat where he thought was alright in a mediating position, holding the fingers of his hands together. Naruto could feel the grass softly touching his legs whenever the wind came around. He closed his eyes and started focusing on finding the feeling that Kurama was talking about. After a few minutes, Naruto felt a very warm feeling on his chest, warmer than even fire, it felt like a fire on his chest. Soon the grass and the trees around Naruto started growing, the grass started moving violently around Naruto, almost like from a strong wind flying around. The ground started splitting slightly around Naruto, the grass on his right side caught a blaze, and on his left side got soaked wet. In front of him, the grass was split in half, almost like from a blade, and behind Naruto, the grass turned brown and crumbled like earth. Suddenly his chakra exploded, Naruto released his chakra, but the chakra risked being felt all around the village. Kurama made sure to close it before the whole village came here to see what was happening. Opening his eyes, Naruto saw the results of his chakra, a few small trees had grown around him, and the grass was a mess around him. While this happened, in a branch close sat a weasel mask on Buu, Ichiha Itachi. The eldest son of the Ichiha clan leader was among the most trusted on Buu of the San Daime Hokage, along with Inue Ka Hadake Kakashi. Graduating from the academy at the age of seven and joining the ranks of elite Anbu at the age of eleven, Itachi was considered the greatest prodigy from Konohagakure, after Minato Namikaze and Hadake Kakashi, and his clansmen even said that he was the second coming of Ichiha Madara. As he sat atop the branch of a tall tree, he keenly observed young Naruto, who appeared to be meditating to unlock his chakra. It had been over an hour, and Itachi was immensely impressed by the boy's patience. Usually, children this age tend to be impatient and hyperactive. He was confident Naruto had reasonable control over his mind. The weasel mask on Buu was one of the few people who knew that Naruto was the legacy of their late Yondaime Hokage and his wife, Kishina Uzumaki. Having known Minato and Kishina personally and Yondaime was like a father figure to him, his mother had once said that she planned to threaten Hokage for not letting her adopt Naruto, but father was able to talk to her down and not do something reckless. As Kakashi had left the village for some urgent mission, he had asked Itachi if he could look over Naruto, and he had readily agreed to keep an eye on the young boy. He knew what the boy contained, and because of that, the kid had no friend growing up whatsoever, and it reminded him a little of his own childhood. Because those who held great power often find themselves standing alone even in a crowd full of people. Ichiha Itachi in no way was an arrogant person, but he knew he was a powerful and intelligent shinobi, and he was yet to reach his prime age. He was startled when the blonde unlocked his chakra and caused havoc in the training field. To say he was surprised would be an understatement. He wondered how could a kid have this much chakra, and he knew that wasn't because of the Kyubi. You can come out now, I know you're there, said Naruto, opening his eyes, he came face to face with a boy wearing a mask around 11 or 12 years of age, waving down at him. Hello, Naruto-kun, said the weasel mask on Buu kindly, as he offered his hand to a slightly wary blonde. Naruto didn't move a muscle for a few seconds as he blankly stared at the masked shinobi in front of him. Due to his lack of positive interaction with people growing up, he was always wary of them. 
He smiled in return as he did not sense any negative feelings from the masked Anbu. Who are you, and why is an Anbu spying on me? He already knew the answer. Cautious, huh? It's a good thing to be. Stated the weasel masked Anbu as he lowered his hand. You still haven't answered my question, said Naruto, as he was still trying to sense any emotion from the masked Anbu. Staring at the young boy for a few more seconds, Itachi removed his mask, revealing his face. Naruto was mildly surprised by the shinobi's actions. Naruto always thought that Anbu weren't supposed to show their faces unless ordered by the Hokage or if they weren't working. I'm not here to harm you, Naruto-kun. I simply wish to talk. Itachi replied. He remained rooted in his spot to not raise any unnecessary suspicion in the young child's mind in front of him. Hearing everything from his Inu senpai gave a vague idea about the blonde's personality. From what he heard, Naruto was far more mature, calm-headed, and smarter than kids his age. He could see his own reflection when he looked at the blonde. Why would you wish to associate yourself with me? Asked Naruto, a bit skeptical, at the raven-haired Anbu. Itachi clearly noticed the awareness in the blonde's tone. He wasn't surprised or startled by Naruto's actions. In fact, he was impressed by the blonde wariness. Tensing of the biceps was a clear indication that the blonde still did not trust him. Growing up, Naruto never made any friends because the villagers feared what resided within him. The very village of Naruto's protecting tramples every day of his life. After all, it is human nature for people to fear for what they do not understand. Closing his eyes for a few seconds, he took a deep breath and made up his mind about what he had to do. He wasn't a very impulsive person, but this was something that he really felt like doing. Itachi calmly walked closer to Naruto and poked him on the forehead lightly. As Naruto looked up, his eyes widened as he saw the small smile that was present on the shinobi's face. At that moment, Naruto felt a wave of happiness wash over his mind. You are not what people think you are, Naruto. The villagers are misguided and blinded by the hate that shadows their minds. Do not think so low of yourself. The shinobi world we live in is indeed a ruthless place. But we shinobi are those who endure for a reason and protect what is important to us. Itachi explained. His mother had told Itachi to look after Naruto whenever he could, and if he could, sometimes help him as a big brother would. Naruto gave him a smile in return as he himself witnessed the horrors of shinobi life from Kurama's perspective. So are you going to give me your name? Asked Naruto. If Itachi was embarrassed at the moment, he did not show it on his face. My name is Itachi Uchiha. Introduced the raven-haired teen. My name is Uzumaki Naruto. Nice to meet you, Itachi-san, replied Naruto giving a slight bow of his head. Itachi was shocked by the manners of the boy. Kids this age introduced themselves like they were being chosen as the next chosen Hokage. Would you mind if I train with you, Naruto-kun? Itachi asked. Naruto smiled and nodded his head. Very well, Naruto said, and took five steps back and turned to look at Itachi. The young Ichiha knew Naruto had no real stand in taijutsu, but decided to fix it once after this bar. Soon they both rushed towards each other. They will live in my new world, or they will die in their old one Dinari's Targaryen. Naruto. He first threw a punch towards his face, but Itachi suddenly disappeared, Naruto immediately turned around, ready to kick him, the Ichiha grabbed his foot and threw him in the opposite direction. Itachi was caught off guard by Naruto, knowing he was behind him. Naruto stood up immediately and grabbed a kunai from his pouch, rolling it in his direction finger, he rushed again, running towards him, but threw the kunai halfway through, Itachi saw the kunai heading towards his chest and moved away, but then Naruto grabbed another kunai and threw at the kunai in midair, causing it to change direction. Itachi was surprised, but the kunai didn't fly anywhere close to him despite changing the direction. Seeing that, Itachi suddenly moved much faster, showing up behind Naruto and softly kicking his foot, making him fall to the ground. Naruto kept the cool head and wanted to try and stand up again, when he saw Itachi aiming his kunai at his face, the young blonde stopped dead on his track, for a moment, he feared that Itachi might try to harm him. Still, he smiled and pulled the kunai away before walking up to him and stretching out his hand. Naruto accepted the hand and stood up, waiting for Itachi to say that he was disappointed by him. Very well done, Naruto-kun. The idea to use the kunai like that was a good one, Itachi said, smiling at him and rubbing his hair, much to the blonde's annoyance. Naruto beamed at the words, his face lightened up like a candle. You mean it? Naruto asked with a sense of insecurity in his voice. Itachi smiled again and nodded his head. He kneeled on his level and pecked his forehead with his fingers and smiled. Now then, let's begin a real training. Do what I say, Itachi said with a stern tone, and Naruto nodded his head in agreement. After one month. The following month Itachi taught Naruto whenever he could, usually, he was in missions, but sometimes had time to teach Naruto about chakra control and other various essential things. 
from sticking a leaf on his forehead to reading books about chakra, clans and other important things. Naruto had taken a liking to seals, after understanding that a seal could hold someone like Kurama on his stomach, the young blonde understood that there was a lot of potential hidden behind Fuenjutsu. Right now, Naruto was sticking leaves on his forehead and balancing kunai on his fingertips. Itachi told him that was an important lesson for chakra control. Kurama had taught him a few things as well, but mostly helped him whenever he was tired, like giving him his chakra so he could train longer. Naruto spends at least 9 hours every day training, Kenjutsu, Fuenjutsu, and Taijutsu. Kurama and Itachi told him that he could start learning ninjutsu once he had reasonable chakra control, and according to Kurama, it wouldn't take long. Naruto had asked Furball if he should tell Itachi anything about what he learned from Hagoromo, but Kurama was against it, he said that despite everything, Itachi was loyal to the village. And Naruto didn't say anything to the old Hokage about Hagoromo or him being a reincarnation of Indra and Ashura Atsutsuki, because he still felt bitter that he had declined any clan the request to raise him. Why? Naruto didn't know why a family like everyone else couldn't raise him. Am I really a monster? Naruto quickly shook his head in denial, the leaves on his forehead and the kunai fell to the grass. The young blonde kept a stoic face, but inside, he felt like someone had stabbed his heart. Standing up, he looked at the palms of his hands, the moon and sun symbol still made him confused. Walking through the training field, his hands behind his head, he thought of his parents. Before he could think of anything, he suddenly felt two chakras rushing towards him, jumping up, a sword cut through the air, Naruto's eyes widened, seeing the masked shinobi with a katana in his hand. Who are you? Naruto exclaimed, jumping away, jumping up to a tree, he turned his head just in time to see another Anbu ready to slice him. Naruto saw the sword moving slower and slower towards his face, Naruto didn't have time to think about what was happening to him before he jumped away from the Chunin level speed attack, usually, anyone else would be surprised by the kid, but they felt and looked as emotionless as a stone. Landing on his feet, Naruto grabbed a kunai from his pouch and was ready to defend himself. These were Anbu and much stronger than him, and not to mention there were two of them. The blonde knew he couldn't outrun them, he was a kid, and being able to outrun an Anbu would be impossible. Naruto, you need my help, Kurama said in anger. Suddenly Naruto was engulfed in red chakra, and his eyes changed, now he had a fully matured Sharingan in each eye and red slit. His nails grew on his hands, two times longer, his whiskers looking more and darker, his hair grew spiky, a red cloak of chakra surrounded him, it almost looked like made of bubbles, a tail slowly grew behind his back. He was standing on his fore, glaring at the Anbu in front of him. Before the Anbu could do anything, Naruto roared at the closest Anbu sending a shock wave, throwing him against a tree, Naruto immediately rushed at the second one. He moved his right hand forward, and the chakra cloak surrounding his hand expanded and moved towards the Anbu. The hand made of chakra looked five times larger than expected, the Anbu avoided the attack, but Naruto was already behind him and sliced his back open, his blood flew like a waterfall, around Naruto as well, but he didn't have time to think, as the second Anbu was behind him ready to stab him. And suddenly, a third hand made of chakra came out from his back and grabbed the sword before it could penetrate his back. Naruto moved his right hand immediately and cut open his stomach, his guts fell in the ground, the blood turned the grass red, the Anbu fell on his knees, but he didn't make a sound, not even moving his hands on his wound to try and hold his guts inside. Naruto's eyes widened when he saw what he had just done, the body started burning, and soon there was nothing left but ash. The chakra cloak around Naruto disappeared, and the blonde fell on his knees, tears running down his cheek, his eyes widened like a plate, his heart beating on his throat like a hammer. I'm Emma Amonst, no, Kurama interjected before he could finish what he wanted to say. Don't even think for a minute that you're a monster. You're not a monster, and the monster is whoever send these people to kill you, a monster is people who threaten to kill a baby in front of their parents. A monster is when someone kills a little boy for no reason other than for the rush of blood. Not you. A monster is when someone forces you to kill the only people that you could call friends. A monster is when forces you to kill numberless people for no reason, Kurama said with honestly in his voice. Just mentioning it, Kurama remembered when he attacked the village when Kashina left the world. Naruto stood silent and thought about what he said. The blonde wasn't stupid, and he knew what Itachi and every shinobi mostly did in their missions. After an hour of nothing but silence, his cheeks dry, he stood up. Thank you, Kurama, Naruto spoke in a tone of relief and happiness, happy that he had someone like Kurama with him all the time. Let's go back to your apartment, Kurama said. Kurama had made sure that his chakra wouldn't expand and be detected by everyone during the fight, but still, someone could have felt Naruto. Tomorrow. Yugao Yuzuki was Konohugakure no Sato's premier swordsman. 
Her skill with the sword far exceeded the basic instruction that constituted the minimal training that was bestowed upon the Anbu within whose ranks she was assimilated into. As a member of the Black Ops division of her ninja village, Yu Gao had been exposed to missions most ninja within the ranks of the village couldn't even fathom. Considering this facet of her life, Yu Gao was understandably upset when the third Hokage, Hirazin Siratobi, assigned her to watch over Kanoha's resident troublemaker and pariah. At the same time, squad rotation policies were being implemented. The vast majority of Kanoha's adult population was well aware of the fact that Naruto Uzumaki played host and jailer to the most powerful entity known to civilization, as a result of some clever handiwork by the late fourth Hokage, Minato Namikaze. In a desperate attempt to save the village he was sworn to protect, Minato sacrificed his life to contain the Kayubi no Yoko within Naruto. Regrettably, Naruto was seen as a physical representation of the suffering and carnage caused by Kayubi attacking Kanoha. As such, many of the villagers indulged in the therapeutic act of destroying the nine-year-old body and spirit to derive some sort of compensation for their losses. During one of these therapeutic sessions, Yuga was able to track Naruto being chased by a rot and an inebriated member of Kanoha's civilian population. A few short moments earlier, the aforementioned civilian had spotted a Naruto walking by. Naruto turned around at the sound of a wooden crate being kicked aside, the man drunk had a large piece of metal in his hand, ready to harm Naruto, but much to the Anbu's surprise. Naruto dodged the attack and just walked away, not wanting to deal with drunken idiots. Yugao reported the night's events to the Hokage as soon as she was able to verify that Naruto had reached his apartment. A small smile graced her features as she watched a boy crash into his couch, falling asleep with a smile of his own plastered firmly onto his face. Upon reaching her commander's office, she relayed the events of the night with unerring detail. It was clear to the aged Hokage that the Anbu agent was particularly proud of how the young boy had stood up for himself. The unmistakable hint of pride is what led to the current topic of conversation between the pair. Hokage-sama, Yugao spoke reverently, if you allowed it, I would like to teach Naruto the basics of Kenjutsu so that he may be prepared for such situations if and when the need arises. He was up against a drunken man who had no formal training in any form of combat. The Hokage turned around to face the massive window in his office as he pondered his charge's request. Hiruzen loved the boy dearly and was painfully aware of the mistreatment he was subject to daily. The idea proposed by Yu Gao greatly appealed to him until he realized that members of his council, both ninja and civilian, would be in an uproar if they learned that the village pariah was being tutored by one of their elite ninjas. The following actions would only cause Naruto more harm than good, as more populous members might be tempted to cause bodily harm to the child. As the Hokage turned back around to face Yugao, she identified the defeated slump of her commander's shoulder and correctly guessed that she would not be given the affirmative. Yugao Chan, the Hokage began looking into her eyes, conveying his thoughts on the matter with a mere address. I understand Hokage-sama, Yugao picked up the signals quickly. She chose to continue, however. I just wish there was some way to pass on instruction to the boy. The pain was clear in his eyes if only masked behind his determination. That statement sparked an idea in the Hokage's mind. The problem arose from private tutoring and the reallocation of a competent ninja's abilities towards a lost cause in the eyes of both councils, but not the passing on of instruction. Liu Gao Chan, I want a critical assessment of Naruto's physical abilities and mental capacity to the best of your ability submitted within a week from today. Along with a recommended training program for the boy to compensate for any lacking in either criterion. I cannot have you spend time tutoring the boy as this would be seen in a bad light by the wretched council, but maybe you can pass on your knowledge in written form. Yugao snapped her eyes to meet those of the Hokage. The idea was sound since instilling the fundamentals of combat need not require an active tutor. Naruto could learn from scrolls about adequate exercises, basic kenjutsu. If he took the matter seriously, he would instill discipline into his life, a value most important for a disciple of kenjutsu. Giving a sharp nod to her commander and a quick salute, Yugao snapped back her mask on and disappeared in a flurry of leaves. The Hokage sighed once again. Sure, a significant problem was on the verge of being solved, but why did his ninja insist on leaving his office using a leaf shunshin, they always left leaves behind in his office. He sighed, a headache ready to split open his head, Itachi had informed him that Naruto was perfectly healthy, well that brought happiness to his old heart, he couldn't help but remember the voice and face Naruto had the last time he saw him. He wondered when Jiraiya would return. Naruto desperately needed someone in his life, but the old son in mentioned in his last letter that he had decided to meet Naruto once he became a genin, at the same time, that sounded good on paper, Saratobi knew that it was a long seven years for the poor boy. Siding on sadness, he returned to his paperwork. Naruto. 
Again on his mindscape, Naruto was in front of Kurama's cage, and his mindscape had changed slightly, now instead of just a boring hall with water on the floor, now they were trees around, Kurama had said that he liked the new mindscape more. Why do you call me Kurama? Naruto asked, knowing there must be a reason that Furball called him. The giant fox, instead of answering, just turned his head to his right, turning Naruto saw Hagoromo standing there, but one thing Naruto noticed straight away, as he looked more transparent, almost like he was slowly disappearing. Hagoromo sama Why are you here? Naruto asked respectfully, looking at the older man. Giving the young blonde a small smile. I need to tell you something before I disappear, it has something to do with your father, he stated, and Naruto had his full attention on him. If you don't learn from your past, you're doomed to repeat it. Long ago in a time forgotten by the people of the world, was an era of enduring rage and unending wars. Humankind had been cursed to fight each other in an eternal war. They fraud over petty reasons, for performing horrific crimes against one another, or for no reason at all, other than violence and death. Different factions often tried to better themselves by weakening their enemies, so their own military strength could be more significant, only for a greater force to overwhelm them later. Humanity had a curse, a distasteful and infectious curse that all beings were infected with. One, more powerful than any war. The curse of hatred. The potent force that can drive an innocent person to become a beast fueled by rage to hunt down those who wronged them. All the while inflicting more pain, brutality and spreading further hatred among people. Hatred was like a tree, and it only continued to grow, as more and more people were festered by it. Those who were directly affected by it and those who bared witness to those horrific outbursts of fury, no one was ever safe from it. One may even say it was genetic and could be passed down the generations. But, what came after hatred? Most would say healing. They were healing from the pain of their lives and the pain they brought on others. Only an imbecile would believe that it would bring about a stop to hatred. What comes after hatred would be either of the following things emptiness, where a person would lose everything that was ever close to them, their own self. The emptiness it brought forth was like an ever-spreading fire with nothing to quench it with or even more hatred. Where the anger would blind people to the truth and make them accept that the world itself was responsible for what happened to them. Among the humans and their inherited hatred was a tree. A tree of massive height and equally enormous power. A tree that was worshipped as a god. This tree had a consciousness of its own, but very few knew the full extent of its intellect. This tree watched as the humans around it fought and murdered each other and cheated on one another for their own gain, while turning a blind eye to others. The tree knew that while humanity had the capacity for good and evil, they overwhelmingly chose the latter option. The tree would often look down upon the humans and be disgusted by what it would see. At times it took pity upon them for their short lives and weakness. The colossal tree didn't know whether it liked being praised as a god or feared like the Shinigami. But it did tolerate the level of respect the humans showed it. Even the tree, with all its foresight, knew that one day wisdom would be lost, hope would diminish, fate would be turned in different directions, and justice would fall. It was merely waiting for that to happen and for humanity to be entirely consumed by hatred. Every thousand years, the god tree bore the fruit of immeasurable power and destruction, a fruit that held its power within. The reasons why one could not lay their hands upon this fruit had been lost to ages. Thousands of years ago, a man named Tenji was the leader of the Land of Ancestors. He desired for peace and tried to avoid direct confrontation with his opponents to avoid wars being wedged. He wished for a peaceful alliance and negotiations with them. One day he came across a lady who could be considered a goddess at first glance in terms of her beauty. She wore a white robe with six tomos in the front and purple lining near her arms. She had beautiful silky and straight hair, the same color as that of snow. But what mesmerized him were her eyes. They were pupil-less, giving off a silvery glow. He saw her gazing at the night sky with such patience. He had not seen this person before in his land, so he spoke to her. May I know who you are? Asked Enji curiously, looking at her. The lady, for her part, didn't reply for a while. A few seconds later, she turned to look at him. I'm Kagri Atsutsuki. He found her voice to be very melodic. Where do you come from? What do you desire here? And again, Kaguya didn't reply for a few seconds. She didn't know if she could confide to him what she wanted or where she came from. From what she felt of these vile creatures called humans, they were filled with anger and darkness. Yet from him, she couldn't feel much of it. I desire peace. Peace among everyone. A place devoid of wars and hatred. She looked at him and saw the man nod his head. I come not from another land in this world, but from the stars. Tenji, for his part, was surprised to hear this. Wanting to know more about her, he began to make small talks with her. After that fateful day, Tenji allowed Kaguya to stay within his palace. He was glad there was another who shared the same ideals as him. They began to meet each other more often and spend more time together each passing day. Soon enough, the two became lovers. 
his devotion to Kaguya's cause for peace made him threaten his own followers with death if they dared threaten peace with the land of that. After Tsukazu, the minister of land of that tried to kidnap Kaguya, Tenji was horrified of Kaguya's godlike powers when he witnessed her kill many of his soldiers in self-defense. Eventually, Tenji decided to betray his love to prevent a war from breaking out. However, as the two sides attempted to capture Kaguya, she ate the god tree fruit and gained unimaginable powers. With her new abilities, she cast the infinite Tsukiyomi. As Tenji fell victim to the Genjutsu, he asked her what she was, unaware that she was carrying his children. Aguya Atsutsuki, for her benevolence for ending the wars and stopping the spread of hatred, was named Rabbit Goddess because of her two horn-like protrusions, which resembled rabbit ears. Like the Shinju, Kaguya was also worshipped as a living god on earth. People bowed before her in respect and reverence for her power and divine will that many considered had no equal. However, Kaguya had not broken the chain of hatred, instead, it merely fractured it. She forced more people to submit to her iron will to stop the hate from spreading. Her power which was once praised, soon came to be feared, and instead of being called the Asagi no Megami, she came to be known as the Oni demon. At some point, Kaguya gave birth to two sons Hagoromo and Hamura. Both children were born with the same power as their mother. The ability to use chakra. These two boys gained legendary prowess of their own, using their own innate ability. When Hagoromo and Hamura found out about their mother's inhuman act of putting people under her control and using them as puppets, they wanted to confront her. But Hagoromo knew that he didn't have enough power to go against his mother yet. He soon came across a toad by the name of Gamameru who could utilize natural energy. Intrigued by the power in Senjutsu Chakra, both Hagoromo and Hamura went to Mount Mayaboku and Gamameru. There Hagoromo learned to utilize natural energy, Senjutsu Chakras. When he returned to confront his mother, he was further shocked. Hagoromo was horrified that his mother, who had given birth to him, could become one with a vile creature in front of him. During the confrontation, Hagoromo awakened the Rinnegan, God's eyes, due to the pain of harming his brother, Himura, who his mother was controlling. Hagoromo was fortunate that Gamameru had given him a tag with a kanji for heal filled with sage chakra, which he used to heal his brother from the mortal wound Himura received. Why, mother? Why would you commit such atrocious acts? Don't you care about the people of this land? Asked an enraged Hagoromo. Chakra is everything. It's life, and it is soul. It needs to be whole again, you insolent child. You dare betray me? Spoke Kaguya with an emotionless face. The two brothers fought in a cataclysmic battle that scarred the very earth. With all their power, the two sons had fought to the near end of their will to defeat the beast, which was their mother. However, the Jubi was connected to the world, just as the world was connected to the Jubi. It was immortal. So, if they couldn't kill the beast, the creature had to be sealed inside a person's body, not to bring about even more catastrophe. Thus, Hagoromo sealed the chakra and soul of the beast within himself, and the body of his mother sealed off inside the moon, which he created with one of his decisive moves Six Paths Shibaku Tensei. The husk of the ten tails was sealed inside the moon as well. So, Hagoromo became the world's first Jinchuriki. And like his mother before him, his own power soared to new heights. He, like his mother, became a god. One even more revered than his mother, wielding the greatest weapon in the world chakra. Hagoromo, who later became a monk, came to be regarded as the Rikidu Sanin, sage of six paths, while his brother Hamura went to live off his life on the moon, where he could be close to their mother. Hagoromo created a religion, one which people would aspire to and believe in and give them hope. This religion was named Ninshu, later known as Ninjutsu. He aspired to bring peace across the lands by teaching people about chakra and its uses in a peaceful manner. So, Hagoromo shared his chakra with different people who were willing to follow him in his quest to bring about a change in this world. He hoped people would connect the chakra with their spiritual energy, yin chakra, allowing others to understand each other. Hagoromo later in his life had two sons. The elder one was named Indra Atsutsuki, and the younger one was called Ashura Atsutsuki. Hagoromo knew that he could not live very long, even with his physical solid chakra, yang chakra. The reason is the extremely potent and vile chakra flowing through his chakra coils. Thus, he intended to teach his sons and his current followers, who he viewed as companions, to teach all he knew about Chakra and Ninshu, before he could pass on the mantle to one of his sons. Indra and Ashura had a relatively peaceful childhood growing up. Ashura was extremely close to his big brother Indra, whom he idealized and hoped to become like him someday. Indra, well, you could say he was more secluded from the two young children, but he still cared for Ashura a lot. When the time came, both Indra and Ashura began to learn Ninshu. It was pretty clear that Indra was more intellectual and more into his studies and practicing the practical aspects of Ninshu compared to Ashura, who would mostly say, it's boring. Why must I study this? One could say Indra was a prodigy in the field of Ninshu, while Ashura was the complete opposite. 
One day, Indra created more practical uses of Ninshu by stating that one can use various elements of the nature by changing the flow of chakra in their body and molding it differently by going through hand seals, Seru, monkey, tetsu, dragon, na, rat, tori, bird, me, snake, ushi, ox. Inu, dog, yuma, horse, tora, tiger, I, boar, hitsuji, ram, yu, hare. People were highly impressed by this discovery, and some even started whispering about Indra being the one who would carry on the way of Ninshu. Although Hagoroma was pleased that his son was progressing in Ninshu and extending its uses somewhere, he had a nagging feeling that Indra would seclude himself more as his prowess increased. At the same time, Ashura would remain in his shadow. Still, he had high hopes from both his sons that they would do what he wouldn't be able to in his life that is, bring about a revolutionary change in this world that will make people understand each other even better and create a world filled with love and harmony. It later became clear that Indra acquired his father's yin chakra and visual prowess, spiritual energy, while Ashura acquired his father's yang chakra and strong body and longevity, physical energy, as in the following years, Indra awakened his Sharingan, Kapi Wee Lai, while saving his brother from a rampaging bear. Ever since Indra awakened the Sharingan, he seemed to have become colder towards people. He started visualizing that one can conquer anything through the power and always stuck to what is correct and incorrect and abode by his rules. Compared to his brother, Ashura was not too advanced in the usage of Ninshu and he could never keep up with his brother during training sessions. Although, people liked Ashura's more cheerful and easygoing attitude, which made him easier to talk to than Indra. One day a friend of Ashura came to him asking for his help. Ashura, my mother seems to be very ill, and the cure which I'm looking for is across the forests, and getting there through the woods will take time. You practice Ninshu, yes? Could you help me out? The man said pleadingly. Ashura was considered a friendly and helpful person, thus, people mostly came to him or Hagorma when needed. Yeah, I suppose I could do that. Just wait here and watch me. Ashura said with a smirk. He did specific hand seals, and a strong gust of wind was blowing from the palm of his hands, which tore down a pathway to the end of the forest, making a quick way to the end. Later that day, Ashura was reprimanded by Indra for blindly helping someone without considering the matter, because of the man who Ashura helped just wanted the forests cut down for his own selfish gains. Indra later locked the man in a dungeon and warned Ashura not to go near him. Ashura being a forgiving person, went to get him out. However, when Ashura got the man out of the cave, the dungeon was inside the cave, they came across Indra waiting there. What are you doing, Ashura? Did I not tell you not to go near the imbecile? Indra asked in a monotone voice. His face showed no emotion whatsoever. Nai san, we should give him another chance. Punishing someone for such futile acts is not the way. And he hasn't harmed anyone. Said Ashura. It doesn't matter. What he did was against the rules, and he must pay the price for it. It was said in such an uncaring manner that it made Ashura flinch. Ashura jumped in front of the man to protect him. Indra jumped towards Ashura and pushed him towards the tree. Ashura hit the tree before falling to the ground. He wouldn't admit it, but his nai sand hits hard. Indra, quicker than a flash, had his hand inside the man's chest sparkling with ration chakra, lightning chakra. nai sand, why did you do that? Ashura was astonished that his nai sand could kill someone just like that. When Indra turned to glare at his brother, Ashura saw the three tomos in his eyes spinning in a threatening way. That moment he saw the hatred in his brother's eyes. This world needs order. It needs change. And it is only through power, and one can hope to bring about such a revolution. That's all Indra said darkly before vanishing from the spot. Ashura, for his part, could not comprehend why his brother started acting maliciously ever since he awakened the Sharingan. He often felt intimidated by those eyes but shrugged it off, thinking it was nothing. After a while, he made a grave for the man and just stood in front of it in the stillness of the night. When he turned to his right, he saw his 2SAN father standing beside him. Indra has changed Ashura. His eyes are like my mother's. Those eyes give him unimaginable power. He desires order in this world and wants to do it in his way. The way he goes about Ninshu is not how I intended it to be spread. Hagoromo said with a tired sigh. After a few seconds of silence, Ashura walked away from the spot. As years passed by, it became more noticeable why Indra was hailed as a genius. He could accomplish anything with little to no effort and started living a solitary life. He primarily believed other people would merely inhibit his growth and potential. Ashura, on the other hand, could do nothing on his own. But through his determination and will, along with the ideals of relying on others, his friends, did Ashura's talents bloom like a flower in spring. While, unlike Indra, who led a solitary life believing that others would only hinder him, Ashura became a capable leader, amassing many loyal followers, most of whom were his childhood friends. He, like his father, wished to begin to spread Ninshu to the world through the help of his friends. 
In the end, Hagoromo seeing both Indra's and Ashura's accomplishments, did the sage choose between the two of them, the heir of Ninshu the prodigious son Indra or the no-good, untalented Ashura? Knowing of his younger son's exploits and the quality of never giving up on the good inside people, gave Hagoromo hope that cooperation and love would bring about true peace. At the same time, lust for power and dominance would only bring about temporary peace. Thus, Ashura was chosen as the heir to Ninshu. Hearing this, Indra walked out of the room angered at his father's choice, while Ashura was shocked. Father, why me? Nai Sen would do a better job compared to me. Said Ashura. Well I do believe Indra is ahead of you in certain aspects, but Ninshu should be spread to teach love, compassion and be used to bring peace. One must be kind and filled with love and have great patience for that. Those are the qualities I see in you, my son. Later that night, when everyone was celebrating, Ashura went to meet his father again. A doubt somewhere in his mind that his father made a wrong choice still lingering in his mind. He came upon the door which led to the hall where his father sat and made a slow walk. He soon reached the place and saw his father sitting there with his eyes closed. Was it the right choice to San? Ashura asked in a low whisper. Agaromo opened his eyes which seemed to give an eerie purplish glow and had several concentric circles and a small black dot as a pupil. He stared at his younger son for a while and answered, Ashura, the world has always been in constant fighting and wars and has started on some of the most unthinkable things. Human life is a precious thing that should not be wasted in fighting wars. I believe that one day, the world shall know true peace. Love and compassion are an essential part of that. Indra is turning more and more like my mother each passing day. Bringing peace to the world via power and dominance is only temporary, and with time people come to fear the power dominating them as they cannot comprehend it. Come here, my son, I shall now pass on to you what is now yours. Ashura approached his father, whereupon, Hagoromo touched Ashura's forehead with his two fingers and passed on his yank chakra, also included six paths and jutsu powers. In another part of the village, Indra had just killed his two most loyal followers with a tear-stained face have a single thought in his mind, whenever someone close to me dies, my Sharingan evolves. Soon, his Sharingan evolved to the Mangaku Sharingan, three tomos converging in together to take the shape of a whirlpool. Furious over his father's choice and being denied what he felt was his, Indra challenged his father's decision. Overcome with anger, jealousy, and hate, Indra attacked Ashura, claiming what he felt was his birthright. However, with the help of others' chakra converging with his and his Rikidu, six paths, powers, Ashura awakened the ability to use Mutan and defeat his older brother. Indra, not taking his loss lightly, left the area before stating he would never follow his way of Ninshu and spend his life trying to destroy him. A few weeks after Indra had left, Hagoromo was counting his final few months on his bed. He knew he didn't have very long to live. He also knew once he died, the Jubi would be free again. To prevent that, he separated the chakra of the ten tails into nine separate parts and, using Omnutan. Binbutso Sozo, creation of all things, made bodies for the nine chakras ranging from Achibi, one tail, to Kyubi, nine tails. He later breathed life into his nine children, Hagoromo called the Bijuus his children, and put the chakra in the respective bodies, each Bijuu having a different ability. A few months later, Hagoromo went to his mindscape to have a few last words with his nine children. He looked at Kurama, Kyubi, with a somber look on his face. Kurama had a few tears rolling down his face, although he was trying hard to keep up the tough act. He was his eldest child and knew how much it would hurt him. A few seconds later, he looked at all of them with a serene smile on his face and said, I will not live much longer. Shukaku, one tail, Matatabi, two tails, Isobu, three tails, Son Goku, four tails, Kakuo, five tails, Seiken, six tails, Jimei, seven tails, Jayuki, eight tails, and Kurama, nine tails. Even if you are far apart, you will always be together. You will be in different sizes from how you are now and have different names. But there will come a time when you will be led down the right path. I hope you learn what true strength is. Hagoromo looks at Kurama and smiles slightly and says, before that time, that day Hagoromo knew there would come a time when someone would be born to bring peace or destruction. Soon after his death, Ashura had three children. Roku Atsutsuki that was later known as Roku Uzumaki, was the founder of the Uzumaki clan. Ashura entrusted him with the sword Dark Blood before he left the world, he lived longer than all his siblings, dying in his sleep at the age of 249. The Hana Atsutsuki was the one who created the most powerful Kenjutsu moves, she was known around the world as the Red Silence. She later married Roku and gave birth to seven kids, four boys and three girls. Ashura gave her the most powerful scroll, the silent secret, but Ahana could never understand what the scroll could do. The scroll was blank and no one could write anything on it and could not even be destroyed by fire or any kind of ninshu, therefore was soon forgotten after a few centuries. 
Takatsu Atsutsuki was given the staff of elements by Ashura and was passed down to children and grandchildren, he later was known as Akatsu Senju, the founder of the Senju clan, which would start a long rivalry with the Achiha clan. Indra Atsutsuki had taken the war fan of his father before he left, passing it down to his future generations. Indra soon founded the Achiha clan and had five kids, two boys and three girls. The Teso Achiha, Demonak Achiha, Atara Achiha, Sanada Achiha and Ilka Achiha. Each one was born with the ability to use Sharingan, later Mangekyo Sharingan. Naruto listened to Hagoromo throughout the whole story, and he knew that wars had been going on for a long time, but to see that it has been almost two millennia since Hagoromo left this world and the humans were still on the cycle of hatred. Would it ever end? Naruto asked himself, not knowing the answer yet. You said you wanted to tell me about my father, Naruto stated. Hagoromo nodded his head, he didn't have that much longer in this world, but wanted to know what Naruto wanted to do with his life. He believed Naruto to be the one to either bring peace or destruction, but with how Naruto was being raised and he was worried about what he could do. Usually, he would want to wait until Naruto reached at least 10 years old to approach him, but he had no time left. I will, but before I talk about that, he suddenly clapped his hands and two figures came out behind Hagoromo. Naruto eyed both of them. He couldn't help but have a feeling that he had met them before. The first had a weird friendly face and was smiling, but the second one was eyeing Naruto almost like he expected to fight the kid. The second one had long dark hair that reached his middle back, a strange war fan tied behind his back and wearing red armor.